It's going to be kind of a two-part presentation, a very quick introduction and overview of Acumatica for those of you that aren't familiar with us, uh, which we'll go through very quickly. And really, uh, I hope the value of this time today is, is having a conversation or starting a conversation with, you know, understanding how the market is evolving and how our customers, because uh, that's what it's all about, how our customers are changing the way they buy uh, in today's marketplace. So looking forward to your questions. I did have uh, you know, some Acumatica partners follow up very aggressively with, uh, with the presentation in March. And certainly if anybody has any questions, we'd love to reach out and continue the conversation. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Acumatica, and for those of you that are, that haven't listened to the Acumatica corporate presentation webinar that I do on the partner portal, there's a couple of key points here on this slide. Uh, and I'll go around the, around the, the block, so to speak. Uh, the first one was born in the cloud. Uh, Acumatica, every single line of code, every piece of data that we produce was meant to be consumed and meant to be delivered in the cloud. What that means to you and what that means to your customers is, hey, there's no rewriting, no re-architecting, no legacy software that has to be you know, squeezed into a, into a cloud tube. Uh, it's ready and enabled to be integrated to other cloud applications and be deployed in the cloud from day one. Uh, for those that don't know, the, the second bullet there of business application experts, or what we like to say, ERP in our DNA, uh, the founders of Acumatica actually spun out of a, a very famous uh, mid-market uh, product called Solomon. So we understand you know, order to cash. We understand closing your books at the end of the month. We did not just build a technology. Uh, we used the most current technology to deliver business processes that we're quite familiar with. Uh, the third thing I like to talk about is cloud, current cloud disruption. And what we mean by that to those that are on the, on the call today is we're not trying to disrupt anything uh, and disruption shouldn't be viewed as a bad word here. What's happening is a current cloud disruption in the marketplace. It happened 10 years ago with CRM being driven out by Salesforce and Sugar and Zoho and all those guys. And then it went into the natural progression of the, the next complicated business processes with human capital management, be it Ultimate Software or Workday or, or Kronos. All of this stuff started being delivered uh, over the cloud. And the natural progression or the natural cloud disruption is for the ERP applications uh, to find themselves in the cloud. We're, that we're already there and other publishers are pushing and, and moving quickly to get into the cloud, but we like to think we have a little bit of a head start there. Uh, the last bullet point I like to talk about is we are 100% partner focused. It is a true 50-50 relationship. We do not have a direct sales force. We do not have a direct professional services uh, organization. Any reference customer comes from a partner. The better you guys do, the better we do. And it's, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, John Roskell has spoken in public uh, many times to our partners when people have asked, what are you gonna do if this doesn't work out? And John is on the record saying, guys, we don't have a plan B. It's up to our partners and my job and the enablement team's job is to make sure our partners are as comfortable, confident and competent selling the Acumatica badge as they can be. So uh, for, those also that, for those that also don't know, 74% of the, of the employees within Acumatica are focused on building our product. So that's all we do is try to deliver the best cloud ERP solution to the marketplace. Uh, we, we've been around for 10 years now. Um, people look at that as a, a double-edged sword. I like to remind people that, hey, 10 years ago, the iPhone didn't exist. Do you wanna go back to the Motorola flip phone or would you rather be you know, working with your iPhone today? We're a newer technology, 10 years old isn't a bad thing. The only reason I show this slide is our corporate headquarters is in Seattle, Washington. Yes, we have offices all around the world. We have engineering in, in Russia. We have engineering in Montreal. We have support and services around the globe, but our corporate headquarters is in Seattle, Washington. We've been very fortunate. Certainly all of us here at Acumatica are very proud uh, of what we've been able to accomplish over the last 10 years. Uh, it's always nice when we say that we think this or we think that, but what we really take a lot of pleasure in, a lot of pride in, is that there are folks outside of our organization, our customers, our partners, and certainly third-party analysts and, and organizations that think very highly of Acumatica. 
Uh, I love the PC Magazine uh, bullet point there in the bottom right hand uh, corner where it talks about, you know, our unusual pricing model. And for those of you that aren't aware, we do not price by the user. We price by consumption, the consumption of the infrastructure that you consume in our cloud. It's a different way to go to market. It's been very, very popular with our partners and very, very popular with our customers. We don't make them make that Sophie's choice of who is going to have access to the system, who's gonna to benefit to the system, who's gonna to contribute to the system. So it's a great way to think about how businesses can run themselves these, day, these days. I also like PC Magazine up top. We're great on inventory management and manufacturing. So I like to tell our partners, if somebody, inventory, if somebody makes something, if somebody inventories something, if somebody sells something and has to account for it, chances are Acumatica is gonna be able to do a great job for them. Continuing on with some Acumatica, you know, analyst opinions. Uh, I put this slide up, every, every company has it, um, but what I like to show in this slide is that the, the Acumatica product portfolio allows us to be very competitive in, in the services industry, in the wholesale distribution industry, manufacturing, e-commerce. Uh, it's a very flexible platform uh, that can do a lot of things. I just tell everyone, like I just said, you know, work from inventory out, because that's where we really shine. Okay, that's the quick Acumatica introduction and overview for, you know, if you've got any questions, uh, we've got a, a great uh, public facing website and, and certainly any, you know, Noel Bloxen and, and Sarita Mitchell on our recruitment team, if you're interested in joining the Acumatica team, can, can answer you a lot of questions for you and point you in the right direction. Um, let's talk a little bit, let's get out of the Acumatica sales job, as it were. Uh, let's start talking about the things that we're all faced with each and every day when we're trying to sell ERP. Uh, regardless of the platform that you represent. Uh, so think of this as really truly a technology agnostic piece. Uh, one of the reasons I'm talking so fast today is I do have a hard stop at about 2.55, uh, you know, filling in for Donna today. So I apologize if I'm moving pretty quickly. I hope you're recording this, Adrian, if people want to listen to it on down the road. I am. Great. So um, I had the chance uh, to sit in on a, on a really cool partner panel uh, in December as, as moderated and hosted by the Gartner Group and uh, a gentleman I happen to have known for a lot of years, Bob Anderson. And, and Bob, who's been the analyst for mid-market ERP for Gartner for over 20 years, uh, gave me permission uh, to use his slides uh, on what's changing in our marketplace. And, and I think it's really important that we all continue to understand and keep our finger on the pulse on, on what is changing. If you look on the left-hand screen there, you see that, you know, cust what do customers want? Instant availability everywhere on anything. Duh, sounds like the cloud. You know, we work differently today. Our customers work differently today. They want to be able to run their business off their phone, off their tablet, off their laptop, off their desktop. They have to be able to do it when they're sitting at the airport, you know, luggage carousel. They have to be able to do it when they're sitting, sadly, in the, in the bleachers, watching their kids, soccer, baseball, football, theater group, whatever it might be. People work differently and they have to have access and availability to their business all the time. The other thing they, they want is they want a digital business platform for launching new products and services. And again, this is from the customer's perspective. They don't want their IT team and talent, you know, doing the care and feeding on databases now and operating systems and printer drivers and making sure the hardware is tuned to, you know, to, to this, that channel, whatever it might be. They want to be able to take that talent that they have and build competitive differentiations for their business off of the platform that they invest in. And for those of you that you know, are, are, are hesitant or are uncertain about that, there's a great article in Harvard Business Review called Finding the Platform in Your Product. I, I would encourage you to go find it and look at it. Um, it just so happens that, that Acumatica you know, has a platform that our partners benefit greatly from and so do our customers. Uh, they want access over ownership. And I think that's a, a key change in the marketplace is that you know, no longer do customers feel the need or the desire to physically own an asset. It's access to their data, access to their business applications, access to their business. And then the last thing is, you know, success measured by outcomes. I'm not going to read all those bullet points, but, you know, we really need to, as partners and as publishers, focus on what does our technology deliver? Uh, it's, it's, I tell partners all the time, yeah, Acumatica is really just the tool in your toolbox uh, that allows you to go to market and say, 
we are partner ABC, we are partner XYZ, and this is the expertise and outcomes we deliver for you as powered by the technology of your choice. We hope it's Acumatica, but really the value to the marketplace is what you do, and we just support that. So what VARs need to do to stay relevant? And again, this is, this is from the Gartner Group. This is what you know, Bob Anderson and the, and the Gartner Group are suggesting, is that you need to innovate uh, with new business models. You have to be very quick uh, in speed to market, and you have to you know, help your customers d deliver competitive advantage. It used to be that we were the keepers of all the knowledge. I'm old enough to remember when I was a Microsoft, oh shoot, it wasn't even Microsoft. When I was a Great Plains partner and one of my customers ordered software, I had a shrink wrap box of software show up at our partner organization and we put it in our car and we drove it to our customer and we opened the box and then we installed it on a piece of hardware at the customer site. Doesn't happen anymore, guys. You know, they go to an IP address, the, the software is live from day one, and it's our job to help them de develop competitive advantage and deliver outcome value to them that the Gartner Group put out. If you look on the left-hand side, what you're going to see there is, you know, small, small organizations, one to 99 employees are listed in yellow, mid-size in gray, and large in, in, in blue. And what they're talking about is, you know, cloud ERP growth year over year by organizational size, and on the right-hand side, you're looking at on-premise, for lack of a better description, non-growth year over year in the future. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that on-premise software is dead, and in a certain number of years, on-premise software is not gonna be an option for anybody. That's not true. Um, there's gonna be a, a governmental requirement or there's gonna be something uh, that requires people you know, to run software on premise. We get that and Acumatica does offer the ability if somebody absolutely positively has to have it you know, to run their software in a legacy configuration on premise. But the reality is, and I think we all know this deep down, is that the majority of our customers are gonna requirement and certainly the publishers are gonna be pushing cloud very, very heavily and Acumatica sits right in the middle there. Again, this is another Gartner slide, you know, where, where Bob and the Gartner team suggest that SaaS changes everything. You know, it changes the products. Um, you know, no longer is this a, a, a pile of source code that you can take to a customer and, you know, just start building, from, you know, building up from day one. It is now a highly configured, highly, highly feature and function rich product that's meant to be delivered quickly, rapidly, and consumed quickly and rapidly, which means following around the circle, you know, clockwise, the sales process has to change, which means the revenue model change. We're talking about a subscription model now, a recurring revenue model. No longer do we collect all of our money from the customer upfront in the, in the old license model and, and put it in the bank. We now have to retain that customer, keep them for, a li for the lifetime that we want to keep them, and collect that money every month, every year, whatever the subscription is that you deploy. Sadly, or not so sadly, or frighteningly, that changes the services model. It used to be, and we, we all know this, that if the software cost X, services were gonna cost 1.5 or 2X, depending on you know, the platform we represented and the business process complexity that we had. That's no longer the expectation from the customer. You know, when they're paying, you know, a third of what they used to pay for the software in a subscription model, you know, you're not looking at a 5X services model. They want to consume this quickly, which means we have to deliver our services more quickly, more efficiently, more cost effectively. That means we have to package them. We need to make them consumable in the way the customer wants to consume them. We can't do everything step by step by step as we used to. We just conducted a, a practice owner and executive and sales workshop last week in Dallas for our partners. And one of the things we talked about is uh, it used to be when we went on site, uh, the example I'll use is we would show up on a Monday and we would walk in and say, hey, let's talk about the general ledger. And we would bill eight hours that day talking about how they wanted their general ledger to look, how many sub accounts they wanted to have, how many you know, elements they wanted to have in their general ledger. And you know what? That bled into Tuesday, that bled into Wednesday, that bled into Thursday. We may take a week talking about customizing and configuring a GL. You know what? That's 40 hours that's now off the budget. 
We have to be able to be the experts where we walk into a customer and say, we believe this is the best way for you to deploy a general ledger in a wholesale durable goods distributor and go from there and try to cut that time down so the time to value is greater for the customer. The green there is what I was talking about. I mean, we've got some workshops in place that are really helping our partners, both practice owner executives, sales executives, and pre-sales engineers understand how this market is changing and what they need to do you know, to kind of begin that transition into the modern bar. So that's the, the quick review of, of the Gartner Group. I think, um, I hope there's a lot of heads nodding, nodding out there saying, yep, we're seeing this. Uh, the market is definitely changing. We, we need to think about how we're going to change. And let's let's walk a mile in the customer's shoes now. And let's say, you know, we all get it. These guys are buying differently. So we probably need to sell a little bit differently. So let's talk about how customers buy today. The, the world we live in has changed. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I'm very fortunate that my, my parents are still alive and, and I talk to them all the time. And, you know, it all comes down to the Google and the interwebs, as my, as my mom and dad would say. Our, our customers are out there doing the Google and they're all over the interwebs gathering as much information as they can before they even talk to us. It used to be we were the most important people. If somebody wanted to learn about Great Plains software, they had to pick up the phone, they had to call us, and we, we, got, we had the great opportunity to go on site, spend time with that customer, and give them all the information under the sun because we were the keepers of that knowledge. No longer, guys, YouTube, Google, the internet, it's out there. And they are looking to, ex, you know, to accelerate their time to a decision to either qualify you in or qualify you out of a conversation. And I'm telling you right now, a lot of us are getting qualified out of opportunities that we never, ever, ever see because of the way customers buy today. We call it the research stage. I'm not going to read every slide. You guys will get this recording and, you know, please look at it. But this is the this is what this slide is trying to convey. I'm letting everybody read the slide, Adrian. I didn't go away. The key the key point here on this slide is the middle bullet is that IT buyers and customers are going to consume at least four pieces of content before they even reach a potential vendor. So my question to you, everybody, and it's, you know, on the, on the call here today is, what kind of content do you have that these people can find and download and consume that are going to push you to the front of the line when they start to evaluate the, the solution they're going to they're potentially pursue? I'll tell you, I, I go through websites all the time. We're going through an exercise right now where we're going through thousands and thousands of websites and we all look the same. There's just a drop down that says, here's the solutions we represent. And then there's a, a single white paper or PDF on the solution. Here's my Sage 100 brochure. Here's my Dynamics GP brochure. Here's my Acumatica distribution brochure. If they can find that from 50 other partners, why are they going to call you? Luck of the draw. You know, everything that we put out there has to be consumable that competitively differentiates us. We don't have that. You know, if, if, if customers are not looking right now, and Gartner Group will tell you, and IDC and Forrester uh, will tell you that at any point in time, 10 to 15% of organizations are looking for a new business management solution. That means 10 to 15% of your install base right now is looking for a new solution. 10 to 15% of the known universe. So as they go out and do the research and are on the internet and sitting in front of the Red Sox game, scrolling through their tablet, wondering how they're gonna tell their boss, you know, which ERP vendor to call, they're looking for you. So it all has to be about the content that you've got out there that's gonna help you stand out. Once they find four pieces of content that put you in the mix, they're gonna consume another 11 pieces of content before they purchase anything. Holy cow, Kent, how are we gonna produce all this content? Well, you don't have to produce 15 pieces of content today, but you have to start by producing one competitive differentiating piece of content, then two, then three. I tell my partners all the time, that the three most important things that, that I think a partner can do is you've gotta know yourself, you gotta know what you're good at, um, are we good at accounting? Are we good at inventory? Are we good at manufacturing? You really have to put a stake in the ground. What are we good at? And then you build your content all around that, that
that separates you from the noise that's in the universe. Then you got to know the product or the platform or the solution that you represent so that you don't overcommit it or undercommit it. Okay? And then you've got to know the customers that you're pursuing. You've got to be that buzzword compliant expert that walks in and says, I know everything about inventory turns, on hand inventory, all the things that are going to make you stand out from the crowd. That's the content that you're looking for, and you need a lot more of it than you have today. And it needs to be consumable in a self service model. I think this is really interesting in that what is the customer's preferred timeline? Customers want to move fast, okay? Six months or less, 85% of the customers say, yep, we want to move fast. Some customers say, no, we're going to take our time. We're going to go a little bit slower. Our customers are telling us that we're actually dragging out the sales cycle. And why are we doing that today? I'll tell you why we're doing that today. We do that today because we go into these incredibly long and lengthy discovery conversations with our customers. Now, you're, gonna, you're all out there saying, oh, Kent, we have to discover. We have to go into a discovery document. We've got to know what we're getting in for. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I'm not going to say you go in blind and you just stick a number on the wall and say, we can name this tune for that many dollars. I get it. But I also think we go into these long, drawn-out discovery documents to generate statements of work and billable hours that are going to help pay the bills, that we're professional services organizations that want to create that large project or create the project as large as we can make it. If we know ourselves, if we know what we're good at, we can start to dial into a profile of a prospect that we're going to pursue and we can move faster and we can walk in the door as the expert of the discrete man. because you know Dynamics GP or Acumatica or Sage or NetSuite or SAP better than somebody else? No, they wanna work with you because you know their business. You know the business processes where they're struggling and you have a track record of success in helping companies improve or drive revenue or drive cost out of those business processes, okay? How easy are you to do business with? How much self-service is available at your company? Is it by industry? Does it refer to a customer? Can you use it in the sales cycle? Or is all of it sitting in your head? You guys have a bunch of talented people in your organizations that have that intellectual property, that content, that domain expertise, but where does it reside? It resides in the 12 inches between their ears. It's not accessible by your prospects or your customers unless you go on site and bill for the hour. We need to take that content and put it into a different model and deliver it a different way. One other bullet point that's really important on this slide is the value and the content you produce, is it quantifiable? If you engage with me, partner ABC, and use my technology XYZ, what economic impact are you going to deliver for your customers? It's not that they're more efficient. It's not that they're more productive. You have to go back to your customer base and you have to start measure what economic impact you've been able to produce as the trusted advisor and valuable partner to your customers. What we talked about a little bit earlier, okay? What's your message? Are you the expert? Do they want to talk to you or do you look just look like everybody else? Man, you're going too fast, Kent. Let's take some notes. A couple of things you need to focus on. If you're going to be a distributor. Do you have a separate landing page for wholesale distributors? Do you have a separate landing page for manufacturers? Do you have different talking points? Do you have diff different value propositions? Probably you don't. For those of you that do, pat yourselves on the back. But for most of us, 
We have a drop down that says, here's our solutions. Maybe we have something that says industries, but what do we have when we have industries? When we drop down industries, we usually have 15 or 20 of them. How can you be an expert in all those things? The customer is asking himself or herself, how can they be an expert in 30 things? You can't. You need to communicate to the market and your customers that I'm an expert in this, and this is why you want to talk to me. So you need content. Blogs, white papers, customer testimonials, package demonstration scripts, economic impact statements. You need to represent yourself as an industry expert, and that's what your content has to screen. And you have to do it for different communities of buyers within your customer. It's really interesting. Um, when, when I talk to partners and, and when I talk to salespeople, I always tell them, look, there's, you, you need to, for every prospect that you have, for every deal you have in your pipeline today, you need to develop a nine by nine box. Um, you know, you have to have a column of three that's labeled executives, a column of three that's labeled line of business, and a column of three that's labeled technology. So, and then you have to have three names in each of those columns, which if my Marine Corps math is correct. That, that comes up, comes up to nine. And then you need to fill in five boxes of those nine with the names of the people that you're talking to and the economic impact either they're looking for or you can provide. And you've got to have content that supports that. I'm going to tell you, if you do that, you're going to be well on your way to being exceptionally successful with that prospect. If you can't do that, I'm going to suggest politely you're a commodity, you're one of three or four columns that a customer is evaluating, and you're going to win on a whim. You'll win some, you'll lose some, but you'll have no clear idea of why you win. So here's the good news. Everyone on this call, everyone that's listening to me evangelize this and preach at you and, and be kind of loud and obnoxious about it, you are very successful. You have happy customers. You've produced value to these customers. The content that you need exists in your past. You have to go back and mine it. You've earned that right. You've earned the right to go back to your customers and say, you know, hey, Kent, when we began that project 10 years ago, five years ago, whenever it was, what were we able to accomplish for you? Is your business better today? And how do you measure that? And that's how you start to build your content. Invest in your customers. Get that return on that investment that you've made. You've earned it. And right now, I don't think you're maximizing the value that you can get from your customers. Because remember, like I said earlier, the value in value-added reseller is not, I hope, I hope nobody on the Acumatic executive team is listening, is not Acumatica. The value is you. We are the tool or the lever that allows you to deliver that value. So the disconnect of what they want and what we provide. I think this is an interesting slide, and if Donna's, on the, Donna's not on the call today, but what we think is important and what the customer thinks are important are two different things, okay? So look at the second one down there, demos. Buyers think demos are really important. Salespeople think demos are less important and marketing people think demos are even less important. Now, why do you think there's such a disconnect between what buyers want, what salespeople want and what marketing people think? I'll tell you why. It's because we all do the same dang demo. We all show up to almost every single customer and we do the same general overview demo. Let me show you about navigation. Let me show you how you do a user-defined field. Let me show you reporting. Let me show you how an individual user can be set up for security. We're not really driving business outcomes. We don't really say, for you to reduce your on-hand inventory, let me show you the steps you can take, the tools that are in place, and the technology that allows you to accomplish that. That's what buyers want. Buyers don't want that, that general demo. Yeah, they want to see the software and get a, get a flavor for what it looks like. Put that on your website. Put a general overview demo on look and feel and, and all that commodity stuff. Put it on your website. Wrap it up on a YouTube video. Send it out a different way. Every time you show a demo to a customer, what they want and what you should strive to deliver is, here's a demonstration on how I can either make you more money or save you more money. That's what every demo needs to be. 
okay? Case studies. Customers are like, eh. Salespeople think they're the greatest thing going, and marketing people think it's even greater than that. Why do customers kind of devalue case studies? First of all, they know in their heart, you're not gonna do a case study on a customer that's unhappy. And two, typically the case study is, they did a great job, we're really happy with product ABC, partner XYZ. Rarely in a case study is, when we did this, we reduced our inventory by this, we increased our sales by that. So yeah, it's like when you give a reference for a job interview, are you gonna give a bad reference? No. When you have a case study, is it gonna be a ca bad case study? Customers discount that. Moving on, one last comment on how they buy. I think you guys all have to know, if you look at the very bottom of the middle column, where it's in yellow, it says 33%, only when they start getting down to selection and implementation, do they go to your website or the, the vendor website, the publisher website, okay? Everything else is Facebook, Google, LinkedIn. I got news for you, you know, as, as soon as you give a customer reference, what do they do? They go to LinkedIn to see if they know anybody there. As soon as you talk about a technology, what do they do? They go to the website, they go to Facebook, they go to, they go to the internet, they, they, they get as much information as they can. They talk across their organization. Does anybody know about Acumatica? Does anybody know about this? Has anybody worked with that? It, it's all out of our control, guys. So the only thing we can control is what content we put out there that's gonna help us rise to the top. So can we all agree the way they buy has changed dramatically, but the way we sell has not? Remember, our value has changed. We're no longer the only place they can go to get information about the technology and how they're going to use that technology that our customers consume. It's gotta be all self-service. And we have to align that with our sales process. So we have to start thinking about selling differently because customers are buying differently. Don't spend time on brochures. When you find a prospect and they're interested in your solution, send them to your Friday demo. See if they show up. If they don't show up, how committed are they to a really understanding a new solution? Well, that's a whole different conversation of understanding you know, why somebody's looking to, to pursue a, a new business management solution. Um, you know, why are you gonna do this? Well, because we need a new system. You know, because you need a new system is not a reason. It may be what they're saying, but if they can't clearly identify for you the economic reasons or operational reasons they're doing this, you know what? They're not a prospect. Heck, they're not even a suspect because they haven't thought it through well enough. So use your content, use your self-service as really a qualifier. You know, hey, Kent, you said you were really interested and we had a demo on Friday and nobody from your team showed up. We created a landing page for you where there was some information we could give you and we could gather from you and nobody's participated in that. Really, how interested are you, Kent, in, in, in absorbing a new system? Clearly not very interested. It used to be that we were, in our suit and tie, we generated awareness, we drove interest, we moved them to desire, and we moved them to take action. This is how it happens today, guys, like we were talking about just a little bit earlier. Not that we've been completely cut out of the equation, but to a large extent, we have. Another way to visualize this is, this is how we used to do it. We used to show up and shake hands. This is how we do it today. I'm not gonna say that there will never be a time when you go on site. Of course there is, okay? That's one of the reasons Acumatica believes so strongly in the partner channel. We do believe there's great value in having somebody sit face-to-face -face as a fully functioning carbon life form across from a prospect and really go to the whiteboard and understand their business. That relationship we believe is really, really important. But for only certain elements of the sales process, you know, not for the general overview demo, not for the corporate presentation. A lot of that can be done remotely or can be done in a self-service model. 
And the only time we are on site is when we're truly delivering that differentiated and impactful, economically impactful message and demonstration to our prospects. So would you all agree that the way they buy has changed? I can see it, everybody's head is nodding. Somebody's isn't, but that's okay. Most of these bullets in the section are actually suggestions for changes to your sales methodology. I hope everybody sees that. And again, these are suggestions, guys. So when are you gonna change your sales methodology? Ah, sorry. I'm gonna suggest you have to start changing your sales methodology today. Kent, I don't have 15 pieces of content, I know. Go make one. Ken, I really don't know what my message is. I don't know what my economic impact is. Okay, go call your three best customers and query them. Hey, Adrian, hey, Noel, hey, Kent, of the last three projects we did with you, help us better understand the success and the economic impact we had with you. If you can't do that, starting today or starting tomorrow, then your sales methodology is gonna to continue to be what it is. You're gonna have the same message you're going to look and feel just like everybody else, and we're probably going to have the same measure of sales success that we've been having the last couple of years. So we see this every day, and I, I, I jumped ahead real quick. I call this the golden retriever approach to sales. This is what we do as partners. We sit in front of our customers, and what does our customer say? Can you add a field? Can you move this? Can you do that? Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Okay? And we, what do we say? We say, yeah. We absolutely say yes for two reasons. One, we want to be nice to the customer. We want to have a good relationship with the customer. We want them to like us. But also, every time we say yes, that's another billable hour. It lengthens the sales cycle, but boy, it adds, it adds hours to the statement of work. Can you make Acumatica or any other system look just like we have it today? Good old Betty in accounting needs her Shift F7 key. We always say yes. We have to start saying no. Salespeople are almost always as good as their last win. I said yes every time last time, and I won. Yeah, but how many did you lose? Or how many did you not even get to? Because you were so focused on that one deal that you had to win, that you had to say yes to on every occasion, that you had to give away hours on, that you had to win because you didn't have anything else. It's hard. I get it. What we do is hard. You got to find that lead. You got to qualify. You got to scope. I get it. I'm not saying it's easy. We can make it easier. So we do all this stuff. We say yes, we say yes, we say yes. We discount our hours, we discount our rate, we discount our product, and then we send over the sales proposal. And all we can hope for is that we were their favorite golden retriever, that we said yes more than anybody else. We got more pats on the head and we're the last one to get a pat on the head. So we're just like everybody else. So why do we sell like this? Adds to the cost of the project, and we like that. It adds to the complexity of the project, and we like that. Because it adds billable hours. But what does it do? It makes the project less predictable. And it adds a lot of time and value to the proposition. So from a customer's perspective, they don't know it unless they've experienced it before, but they're in for a bumpy ride. This is an interesting summary and study by Deloitte. So if you look at this, this is the top 10 criteria for purchasing an ERP solution. Most importantly, in the middle column on what customers thought was most important the second time they purchased. So the first time they purchased, it was the price of the software. The second time somebody had to purchase an ERP system, the most important element was level of support provided by my reseller partner. In this instance, guys, support does not mean billable hours. Support means they understand my business. They deliver outcomes from me. I think this is another slide that, that, that we've done here at Acumatica, but I think it's valuable and viable for every sales organization because this is the challenge we face each and every time. Whether we want to admit it or not, Every one of our prospects has a, has a spreadsheet or a, a Word document that looks like this. They have an evaluation topic and the three vendors that they're looking at, and everybody does a corporate presentation, everybody does a product demonstration, everybody puts an implementation estimate, and then they just sum it up at the bottom. 
And since we all do the same dang thing, and since we all look the same, really the only thing we're giving our prospects uh, to choose from is price. Now they usually don't turn, choose the cheapest and they don't choose the most expensive, they choose that middle one. Well, that's not a good way to make a decision. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to inject into the evaluation things that only we can do or things that we're really good at. You know, I call it the Acumatica partner value. These are the three things that you inject that say, I manage inventory this way, I drive sales this way, I reduce costs this way. And then you demonstrate to that. You get away from the overview demo. You focus in on the true economic impact and value that you provide customers that look just like them. Make them evaluate the value you produce, not some corporate presentation and overview demo that you're doing. I always ask partners all the time, if, if you get asked, when do you want to, do you want to demonstrate first or do you want to present first or do you want to present last? Everybody says, I want to present last. I believe that's 180 degrees wrong. You want to go first. You want to go in and set the bar. You want to change the game. You want to make everybody else come up to your level of value and expertise. Because that way we get away from having to fuss with, well, let me reduce my rate. Let me reduce my hours. Let me get a better discount from my publisher. You know, easy to say, Ken, but how many of us are really thinking this way? Not many. So who do they buy from? If you look in the upper right-hand corner there, supplier has widespread support across my organization. Easy to buy from. What do those two things point back to? That points back to the, the, the nine-person grid we were talking about. You have fans and, and supporters in the line of business. You have fans and supporters in uh, IT and technology. You have fans and supporters in the executive suite. You don't just have that one person who's the project manager or your coach who's supposedly giving you all the good information. Offers unique, valuable perspectives on the market. Educates me on new issues and outcomes. This is who people buy from, and this is who we need to, who need to strive to be. Do we ever ask these questions? If you could change three things in your business, what would they be? What's the single, big, single biggest opportunity you see in your business? What's the biggest challenge you see in your business? What are the five most important results you will need to see coming out of this project? And then once they give them to you, make everyone in the organization agree and prioritize them. I always challenge my partners. I say, guys, when you get to this conversation topic, make them go to the whiteboard. Make them go there and say, yes, this is number one. Yes, this is number two. And I also ask them, how are you going to measure that? And when are you going to measure that? If you understand those five things and you get the customer to agree to the prioritization and you develop your product demonstration, your whole sales story, and your economic impact around it, you are going to be, I might suggest politely, first, the only partner that's doing that. And second, you're going to be the winner. And third, <laughs> I just thought of this one, you're probably going to get more money for what you do because you're not going to be selling a commodity product you're going to completely separate yourself. Oops, I knew it was in there somewhere. Sorry about that. How will they measure the economic impact of those five things? Please promise me you'll never ask these questions again. And the reason I put these up here is, you know, we talked to, you saw on a couple of slides back, this whole concept of BANT qualified, budget, authority, need, and timing. That's a great concept to internalize. And you always want to be on the lookout for messages or signals you're getting from the customer about their budget. OK, and they're who's the authority and what their real need is measured economically and, and what their timing is. You always want to have your ear listening for that, but you never want to do what I hear salespeople say all the time. What's your budget? Are you the decision maker? When do you want to go live? I've been on calls where the guy basically just goes through the thing. Uh, what's your budget? Are you the authority? What's your need? What's your timing? And, and, and right. To the, guess what? The customers hear this all the time and they hate it because you're insulting them. Of course, I have the authority. I wouldn't be talking to you. Are they going to tell you? No. What are your pain points? What keeps you up at night? Can you tell me about your business? Yeah, those are important things to know, but we can get that information without asking these trite and commoditized questions. What will it take to earn your business? Or do you value quality over price? 
I've heard people ask these questions. Don't do it, guys. Please. I'm begging you. You're killing me, Smalls. You're killing me. You're wasting their time and you're wasting your time. We're almost at the end here. Um, I'm, I'm a sales nerd. Um, you know, I've been through strategic selling, solution selling, spin selling, sandal selling. I just think it's really interesting. I like trying to figure out in, in, you know, how people buy, why people buy. There's a great new book out there called The Challenger Sales Model. I encourage everybody to go out and read it, uh, get it, or at least read the summaries of it because it really speaks to how we need to differentiate ourselves as sales organizations in the new customer market. So here's the Challenger Sales Model, and it's basically at the end of the day, guys, challengers get more business. And what do we mean by challenging? We're not asking people to be arrogant or confrontational. We're asking people to be confident industry experts. That's what our customers are looking for, okay? Trust me, when you're in that conference room, they are desperately hoping you're gonna be able to say, here's how we can help, here's the track record of us doing it, and we know we can do this with you together. They're looking for you, they're not the experts. We've all sat in our car after a prospect call, after a presentation, we've all looked at each other and said, how do these guys even make money? How do they stay in business? It's our job to help them be better companies. That's what's so fun about this business. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope it was helpful. I went a little faster than I wanted to. I had a hard stop at, at 2.50, so I'm a few minutes early. Um, you know, if you're interested in becoming an Acumatica partner, um, Noelle Bloxon is our partner recruitment manager. You can reach her at noelle.bloxon at acumatica.com. Um, if you're interested in learning more about, you know, the Acumatica enablement program, uh, Noelle can help you there. And certainly if you're an Acumatica partner and you want to learn more about the workshops we do around the 21st century bar or, or this type of a sales methodology and you haven't been through the workshops yet, don't hesitate to reach out to your Pam or reach out to me directly and we'll get you the information that you need. I wanna thank everybody for, for letting me uh, take you on this journey today. I hope it was a good use of your time today. Adrian, thanks for letting Acumatica you know, join with you today.